Hey students, welcome to your first lecture in this business communication class. So this lecture isn't going to focus too much on any book content. That'll start in week two. But this is just give you a top line of the course, some things around grading and other things that you need to know. So when we think about business communications, you know, there's so many channels out there in these large organizations. We obviously have uh, live phone conversations. We can text each other. We can send email. We can have a live meeting or a group meeting. We can do a formal presentation. There's even social media that we're using. There's the company website. And you know we have LinkedIn that we use to kind of keep our resumes updated. So there's so many channels and these humorous little gifts that you see over here from the movie Office Space, which if you haven't seen it, it's a must see for all business majors is that there's a lot of redundancy in business communication. We can really get kind of bombarded and overloaded with so much communication. So what I'm going to be teaching you in this course is how to communicate clearly, completely, and concisely so that you only have to communicate once and your message is received and acted on correctly uh, with all the stakeholders who receive your message. Now, that's the ideal world. That's the ideal world, right? Uh, we know that the reality is, is that a lot of communication gets misinterpreted. Which really brings us to this next slide. Why do we even have to take a business communication class? You know, uh, what we're hearing from industry, from employers, is that they really are looking for effective communicators. And when we say effective, that means that you move projects forward through your communication. So we have to be clear and yet friendly in our communication. We have to be efficient and yet thorough in our communication. We don't want to be overbearing, and yet we need to make sure that we're following up appropriately to make sure that work gets done. So in large organizations, there's many layers of communication. There's many different channels of communication and things can get misconstrued, misunderstood. People get upset. Timing can be bad and that all results in poor communication. And when we have poor communication, the organization breaks down. So businesses thrive on efficient communication because businesses are composed of people and people need to discuss things and understand each other in order to move projects forward. So for you to advance in your business career, I'm gonna be giving you some tips on what you can do to be concise, clear, thorough, when to use the correct channel, and how can you inspire people to follow you and follow your directions? That's what this course is about. And that's what we're hearing from the employers out there. So obviously at this point, you all know how to write at some level, you've already, completed your English prereqs, but how to write efficiently for business, which is different than sending text messages back and forth or posting on social media. It's more formal and yet it needs to be concise. And businesses are definitely telling us that they need people who have good cultural competency and they can be clear and firm and yet compassionate and have those softer skills. We all know how to text and email but when you're dealing with somebody face to face and maybe you have to deliver some bad news or give a negative performance review, how do you do that in a efficient and well communicated way? That's what we're going to be talking about. So I'm excited to be teaching you this stuff. Uh, the next couple of slides are going to talk about uh, the point values and the assignments in the course. There is a complete syllabus on the Canvas site. So when you go to the week, uh, the start here module, you'll go to the course resources page. Uh, you have a syllabus link there. That's the Canvas syllabus, which is a condensed syllabus. But within that Canvas syllabus, there's a link to the full syllabus, which has everything. So that's the week by week assignments. That's all the point values. And that's also how to communicate with me, everything you need to know. So please make sure that you look for that uh, full syllabus link, print that off, read it and email me if you have any questions. I'm assuming that you've read the syllabus and that you understand the guidelines in the syllabus, like how to communicate with me, how quickly I'll respond, how quickly I'll grade work. 
policies on late work. All that is spelled out in the syllabus. So please, sure, please make sure you know that uh, so you don't ask me a question that's already answered in the syllabus. And after you read through the syllabus, if you do have questions, please send me an email. I'll be happy to respond. A quick intro of myself. You guys will be introducing yourselves on your first discussion board this week. So I'm a San Diego native. I grew up in San Diego and I'm 53 years old. I'm new to Miracosta. This is my first semester at Miracosta. I've been teaching, however, for 13 years. Uh, my last 12 and a half years were at Grossmont College down in El Cajon, where I taught business communications as well as marketing and advertising and consumer behavior courses. So I've been teaching for a while. I live up in North County. I live in Carlsbad. So I'm thrilled to have been able to make the switch uh, up here and I can work in the community where I live and eliminate my commute. And uh, I really enjoy the Miracosta family and students. So I'm, it's, I'm thrilled to be at this new college. So over on the side there, you'll see the links uh, to uh, places where I used to work. On the week one module, there's also a link to my resume. So check that out. And if you have any questions, my background's in marketing. And out of college, I wanted to be a copywriter, but all the jobs were up in Los Angeles, which is a much bigger advertising agency market. Didn't want to go to LA, wanted to stay in San Diego. So I managed to work for Lambesis Advertising, an advertising agency that's still around. They do Charles David shoes and a lot of fashion accounts. And I was an account executive. So that's the liaison between the agency where all the creative folks went to art school, copywriters and art directors and graphic designers and the client who wants to sell their products and you know make money off of their investment in an advertising agency. And the account executive typically has a business degree and they're working with the client to understand what they want and uh, get campaigns and creative product produced by the agency and uh, sold to the client. So a lot of communication. That was kind of my beginning into uh, you know, intense business communication, a lot of deadlines, it's fast paced, there's a lot of pressure, there's zero tolerance for mistakes. So advertising agencies are a great proving ground uh, if you want to pursue a marketing career. And then later I went client side, which means I ended up working for companies as opposed to an advertising agency. And you can see some of the companies there. Those underlined in red are links to the websites. Now, if you're watching this in the YouTube video, those links may not be available. If so, you can just Google those companies if you want to know more. But Westfield America, uh, which manages and owns a lot of the shopping centers in San Diego, and Petco Animal Supplies, where I was a regional marketing manager. They're headquartered here in San Diego. And then I kind of finished up my corporate life at Jack in the Box, where I held different positions. I had a couple of promotions there. I was a regional marketing manager first, and then a product manager, which oversees products from idea to system rollout. And then lastly, a consumer research analyst. So, and all these were different uh, marketing capacity positions. So I have a lot of marketing background and I also teach marketing courses here at Miracosta. So if you're interested in those, uh, you can get that information there. Okay, Nate, that's great. But what are these pictures? They don't seem to have anything uh, related to your professional background. That's just a little bit about me. So when I was 38 years old, and really the reason I came to teaching was I had a pretty significant health scare. I had uh, a cancer diagnosis when I was 38, which is young, um, 53 now, and that cancer runs in my family. So I left my corporate career and came to teaching. I love my new career. I've never really looked back, and even though it was less money, I've been really happy teaching and love working with these students. So, but that was at 38 years old. And so I went from selling burgers to drinking green juice and, and being uber healthy. And I'm a big proponent of being healthy while you're young so that you can have a lot of energy and apply that health to your career, which will help you be more successful and have a happier life. So take care of that body. So that's me, uh, pictures of my mason jars of green juice. I have two boys, I'm a single dad. I have a 19 year old up at Cal Poly S. Slow and a 16 year old who's still in high school. I live in Carlsbad. I grew up in Ocean Beach, California. Uh, so I grew up by the ocean and being in the water, surfing and skateboarding was a big part of me growing up. And so I still do that. 
a little slower perhaps, but uh, just know that you're when you talk to me, and hopefully we get a chance to maybe meet live, that's, that's still kind of a part of my life and a little bit of, of my um, background of who I am. There's also a picture there of me wearing a, a tank top, and it says 99 cent on it. That's me when I was younger, and I'm rapping at one of the Jack in the Box corporate events. These are some of the things you have to do when you're in a marketing department. Uh, this is for our annual uh, restaurant managers meeting. You know, there's over 2,000 restaurant managers attending that meeting. And I was 99 cent, which was 50 cents older brother. And we were part of the, that's when I was in the uh, product management team. And that was our introduction to uh, us launching our new products. So a different time, a different place. That's a little bit about me. My resume is also on the um, start here menu link under course resources. And it's also in the week one resources. So if you want to check out my resume and my professional background, ask me any questions. So I'm a member of the American Marketing Association. Um, I'm also America of the Social Media Society. I'm not super active on social media, but I do stay abreast of what's going on. And uh, I'm here to answer your questions. So if you have any questions on that marketing side, feel free to ask me that as well. Okay, so let's talk about the, the course menu and what you'll be doing in this course. So these are kind of the main four buckets of work that you'll be doing in this class. And the next slide, I'm gonna cover the point values for each of these. So, But you're gonna have some quizzes. Those start in week three, and then there's a final exam. There's a study guide that's posted under the start here menu under course resources. And again, we'll start quizzes on week three. And most weeks you'll have a quiz to kind of make sure check learning. And the study guide will be what you'll reference before you take those quizzes. Written work. So this business communication class has a series of written assignments. And these are kind of mandated uh, for this course to transfer. If you go into uh, Cal State San Marcos or San Diego State, uh, these components of the course are standard where, wherever you take this course at a four-year university or at a community college. So there's four written assignments, things like a bad news message and a persuasive letter um, that we'll be working through. There's four of those written messages. You have one presentation, and that's you doing a video presentation just like I am here. And we'll talk about that later uh, in the semester, but you're basically recapping what you learned from your research assignment. Now there's no bullet point on it here, but uh, your fifth written work piece would be the re uh, research paper, which is at the end of the semester. And I'll get into that. So one presentation, you talking to a camera. Now I will say this, if you want to advance your business career, the best thing you can do is get good at public speaking. It is part and parcel, paramount, job number one, the most important thing that you can get up and be comfortable talking in front of people and promoting your ideas and being able to speak comfortably in meetings and in front of larger groups. I know public speaking is the number one fear greater than death itself, which doesn't really make sense. And I used to hate public speaking, hated it, but I've been doing it for a long time. So it's like any other skill. The more you do it, the more comfortable you get at it, the better you get. And eventually you'll get to a point where you have competence and whatever fear and anxiety you have about public speaking will be greatly reduced. So don't run from it because you don't like doing it. Go there because you know it's important for you to advance your career and increase those dollar signs on your salary. So don't take no for an, exam for an answer. Don't let fear hold you back from getting what you deserve, which is a rewarding career and presentations are a part of that. So in this course, you only have to do the one presentation. So I'm hoping that if you're one of the types of students who really doesn't like presentations, and maybe this online course was more appealing to you because of that, go do more public speaking. Join Toastmasters, uh, take speech classes at Miracosta or other colleges, take every opportunity to improve your public speaking. It's so important to you advancing your career. I can't stress that enough. So at any rate, in this class, you only have the one and it's talking to your computer. So that's pretty easy. And then there's also discussions. We're in an online environment. So the discussions, if you've had other Canvas courses or online courses, those are gonna be typed and you kind of um, uh, opinion-based 
assignments and responding to some other students. So, so that's how that's kind of the meat and potatoes of what we're doing in the course. And as far as how all that work is graded, there's a thousand points total in the class. And you can see how they break down into these point values for the different components in the class. So this is also listed on page four of your full syllabus. So again, make sure you go to the Canvas syllabus page, which is a condensed syllabus. And then within that condensed syllabus, which also shows you what you're doing each week down at the bottom, it's a handy uh, reference tool. But there's a link to the full syllabus, which is a PDF file. But you want to print that off. Make sure you read that. And if you have any questions on the syllabus, send me an email. I think I mentioned this in a previous slide, but I'm just going to say it again. I'm assuming that you've read the full syllabus and you understand communication policies, policies regarding late work, all that good stuff, weekly schedule of assignments, all that good stuff. So how to communicate with me. Please make sure you read through that syllabus so um, you're not asking me a question on something that was already offered it, uh, explained in the syllabus. So I wanted to take a moment, and this is something I actually learned from a biology professor, and give you a study tip. And this is called the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. Let me ask you a question. Have any of you ever had the situation where you're in the classroom and you're taking notes and the instructor's going through something that's complicated? For me, it might be like calculus or, uh, you know, those type of courses didn't always come easy to me, but I did manage to get a, an MBA. But it makes sense when you're in the classroom and then you get home and you look at your notes maybe a couple days later and it doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> or you go to do your homework and the problems that they ran through in the classroom made sense, but now they're not making any sense and boy, you're not getting them right based on the answer key and you're frustrated. So uh, this scientist, Ebbinghaus, did some research around how can we retain information more completely and longer in our brains? And he found this concept of how quickly we lose information. So this graph here shows you from when you're exposed to something that you want to remember to how quickly how much of that retention falls out. So we have 100% when we're exposed to it. But you can see that within one day, we're down to about 30% recall of that information. And uh, by the time we get to two days, it's like 25%. So how do we retain more information? This is an important study tip that I thought would help you, not just in this class, but in all the classes you're taking. So the next slide talks about how we improve these numbers. The secret that Ebbinghaus realized through his research is called spaced review. And that means if you look at your notes right after the class and then again 10 minutes later and then certainly you know within 24 hours through this spaced review, just a quick review of your notes, you'll find out that your retention will be much higher. So look at these numbers here. The blue line represents no spaced review whatsoever, and the information falls out very quickly. However, if you review your notes right after class, just take a few minutes, maybe as you're walking to the next class or driving to work, uh, not a good idea, but, <laughs> um, uh, but immediately after class, you just run through your notes real quickly, and then 24 hours later, and then a week later, et cetera, and then within a month, then it sticks. The information sticks. So this is a, a good way to improve our studies. When I was in school, and maybe you're this type of student, I took a lot of notes. I was a copious note taker, and they're talking, and I'm taking notes. I just tried to like almost be a stenographer of writing everything down that the instructor was saying. Now, this is a while ago, and this is back when we didn't really do much recording in the classrooms, and there wasn't any online support. But when I went back and got my master's degree, at this time I'm working professionally, I'm commuting to school, I didn't have a lot of time, I took virtually no notes, but I listened intently in the classroom and I asked a lot of questions. I was a much more 
active listener and I took some notes in the class and then I did review those notes always when I got home and I did better. I did better with my master's program than I did with my undergraduate. So kind of organically, I was stumbling on some of these uh, spaced review components to how I studied my material. So try to review your notes routinely right after class, within 24 hours, and at least one week after that, and see how it works. The other thing I want to talk about, just a couple slides here, and then we'll be done with, with this opening lecture is about teams. So you already know that you only have the one presentation, so you're getting a online version of, of presentations, whereas in the regular classrooms, they're doing it live in front of the other students. The other part in this online business communication class is that you have a project, which is this research paper. You're doing it independently, um, and your presentation is also independently. Now, in the on campus version, I actually have students work in groups on some of this. It's a little difficult to execute that in the online world, um, at least for this first class. But I do want to stress the importance as part of our business communication education that we learn how to work in team environments. It's very important and it's a big part of how businesses set up their departments and organizations you will be working in teams. You'll be working in teams in your professional business career and also probably when you do your upper division stuff um, as you're pursuing your four-year degree, your uh, upper division courses, oftentimes you'll be doing a lot more group work. So groups, teams have a lot of advantages. You can get a lot more work done. Uh, and companies love these, what they call cross-functional teams, which means rather than try to take a new product idea and move it through one department to the next department, there's all these silos and it's very time consuming to go from purchasing to operations to marketing to research to uh, quality assurance. I'm kind of using jack-in-the-box terms here, but to take a product through each of those departments and get approvals would take forever. So what companies do instead is they create these cross-functional teams, which basically are like a mini boil down version of the company itself. Let's get somebody from operations, from training, from purchasing and marketing and uh, research and development and put one person, one representative from each of those departments and put them on a team, cross-function. So folks from different functions, departments in the company coming together as a kind of mini boil down version of the company itself. And then they can take a new product idea and move it through their respective departments a lot faster. And they have responsibility for doing that and they're compensated for that. Companies have found that when employees work in teams, whether it's a cross-functional team or a matrix, we'll get to those later, that they can move initiatives through faster and employee morale and uh, loyalty, longevity uh, improves. So companies are more efficient and you know, two heads are better than one, but it requires good communication to have a team work successfully. How do we get a team to have good synergy where everyone's kind of uh, working together and adding to um, a larger whole? If you think about it, if you're uh, work on team projects in school. I know some students would be like, I'd rather stick hot needles in my eyes. I've only had bad experiences. I prefer to work alone. And other students uh, have said, you know, I've had some great team uh, experiences where we tackled a big project and we were all just kind of in the flow, working together. Everybody contributed equally and it was fantastic. So how do we get those experiences? How do we get these successful team environments? Well, a big part of it is what are the communication patterns within your team? It's not necessarily the people that you're in your team. You might think, I end up doing all the work. Everybody else is a flake. You actually might be part of the problem. So um, it, it might be a communication problem and different personality types and how do we harness those different personality types so that everybody is contributing in a way that best serves their personality type. Now that's getting a little bit deeper. 
So for successful teams, you got to build trust, meaning you have an open communication and clarity about what do we do if people aren't delivering or doing their their, their work. Um, we have to have shared leadership. So, you know, people are uh, everybody's got equal weight on what they're doing in the group. Good listening skills. When you have people in the team environment and one person is dominating, well, that can be OK to have a strong leader. But when you don't have other people buying into the project, then in, by contributing and discussing, then you don't have buy in and then they're less likely to want to contribute towards that project. So vertical and horizontal information flow just means that the folks within your team are communicating back to their department and the team is also communicating up to the higher ups who are you know, responsible for that product launch and also down to folks who have to execute uh, that product launch by way of example. So we'll get more into teams later. In week two, we'll talk on uh, chapter one and I'll, I'll go into teams in more detail. So lucky for you in this course, you don't have to work in teams, but as I was saying earlier about the importance of getting comfortable with presentations, we're touching on them lightly in this online class. The other piece is we're not directly working in teams in this class. Now, if you want to work in a team on your research project and your presentation, send me an email. And if there's enough of you that want to do this in a team format, then I can certainly put that together for you. But I'm not manda mandating that you have to do that. This slide gives you some skills for successful teams. We have to be able to give people frank feedback, criticism, People always think criticism is negative, but it's feedback. If you can actually listen to somebody's feedback about you, what are people's impressions of me? Am I doing a good job or not? And if people are giving you feedback and if you're receptive to that feedback, well, you're going to improve. So, but we have a lot of emotional barriers to receiving feedback. Our feelings get hurt, right? And our egos are attached. So um, the ability to take uh, feedback in a constructive way and deliver it in a way that's not personal, you're lazy, is personal versus saying you seem to be routinely late to our meetings is feedback. So those are different ways of communicating the same issue. Does that make sense? So you have to find ways to really uh, promote team function, understand the feelings and needs of your coworkers and what's going on. Uh, cultural barriers, if you're working internationally, it's a global environment now that how they do things in one country can be very different from how they do things in another country. And somebody's got to lead. So applying those leadership skills. So we'll be diving into teams. Again, we're not working in teams directly in this class, but you have the option of doing that. If you want to work on the research project and presentation of findings as a group, send me an email. And if there's enough of you, I'll set you up as a group. All right, thanks for listening. So my promise was to keep this under 30 minutes on this uh, opening lecture, and it looks like I'm gonna make it. So your week one assignment is simply a discussion where you're introducing yourself to your classmates and looking at a quick video about millennials and getting some feedback from you on that. Okay, read the syllabus, the full syllabus, located under the syllabus uh, section of the course. Any questions, send me an email. Thanks for listening so much. I'm looking forward to working with y'all. Bye-bye.